welcome everyone to our HOPE series brought to you by Obesity Canada. My name is Rachel Atkins and I am the Director of Strategy with the Toronto Chapter of Obesity Canada. Our aim with this HOPE series is to build community and share knowledge with you that provides hope to all of us as we navigate through these very uncertain times. Um, as you can see from the participants and where everyone is calling in, this has turned out to be quite a global community that we've created. And today is no exception. Every time that we have these conversations, we've got folks calling in from all over the world. And today we have individuals from Finland, from Ireland, from Lebanon, uh, and of course, many other countries. So welcome to everyone. We're so excited that you're here. Um, today is actually our last conversation in the HOPE series, and uh, that's very sad, but I am very happy to share with you that we've saved a really interesting hot topic for our last conversation, and that is managing food addiction beyond the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, as always, we have our very esteemed host, Dr. Arya Sharma, with us today. Dr. Arya Sharma is the Scientific Director with Obesity Canada, and he's also a Professor of Medicine at the University of Alberta here in Canada. So with that, I'd like to hand it over to you, Dr. Sharma. Well, thanks, Rachel, and uh, well, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, good night uh, to all of you, because uh, we do have a very international audience here. Uh, so just to remind everybody, I mean, Obesity Canada, as most of you probably know, is Canada's national registered charity, uh, and it's dedicated to improving the lives of Canadians uh, through obesity research, through education and advocacy. Uh, and as you might be aware, Obesity Canada educates health professionals, it supports researchers, it supports trainees, uh, it supports students, and it works quite closely with policymakers uh, to ensure that all Canadians living with obesity have the same access to prevention and to treatments uh, as you know, Canadians living with any other chronic disease. So uh, the topic that we have today for you is focusing on addiction. And, and, and it's really uh, you know, an honor and a privilege to have two folks here who are extremely well-versed in the whole field of addiction. So I'd like to, first of all, uh, welcome uh, Sandra to the show. Now, Sandra, she'll introduce herself. Uh, she's also an addiction counselor, but I think she's also, you know, has some personal experience she might want to share with you. So, uh, Sandra, over to you. Yeah. Hello, everyone. I'm Sandra Elia. Um, I am the vice chair for Obesity Canada, the Toronto chapter. And as Aria stated, I am a food addiction counselor. And I do have my own history um, with living with obesity and living with food addiction. Um, but I'll save uh, those juicy details for later on. <laughs> okay. And we also have with us uh, Peter Salvi, who's with the University of Toronto. And he's probably one of the you know, one of the foremost uh, addiction experts in the country. Uh, and so over to you, uh, 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 Peter, just tell us a little bit about yourself and the kind of work that you do at CAMH and, and, and at the U of T. Sure. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, so I'm an addiction medicine physician here in Toronto, a professor in family medicine, public health and psychiatry. And, uh, you know, I run a, a, a large treatment and, uh, and research and education program uh, for addictive substances, more specifically tobacco. And, uh, and I've been more and more over the years getting more and more interested as, as people have started coming to me about these things around the issue around food. Is it addictive or not? And, uh, and, and can, what can we learn about uh, treatment of uh, food addiction with or without obesity um, and from what we know about treating other addictions? So that's how I come to this to this work and you know take a whole mind body society kind of approach to this work so so, so peter let me let me ask you right away so in, in these covid times how has that changed your your work and are you yourself feeling the urge that you need to consume more food during the lockdown oh that's that's excellent actually you know as soon as the pandemic uh, hit uh we, I took on, uh, created a, a COVID resource because I had done this during SARS, actually creating an online resource for people. And so we created an online resource for people to manage their stress and, and it, it's called CAMH.ca COVID-19. And you'll see it has all those issues. And we do know that when people are stressed, consumption goes up. 
uh, most often. There are some people who will actually restrict, but for many people, consumption goes up, as you know, it's comfort. So whether it's, you know, food or alcohol or substances, or th those things tend to go up. But very interesting, smoking may have gone down, but at, because obviously smokers are at high risk of getting a respiratory infection. So, so uh, many people sort of, we, we see in the UK anyway, that's gone down, but alcohol has gone up. Okay, well, I can see why. Uh, yeah. So, Sandra, let me start with you. Now, you, you introduced yourself, um, you know, you said that you've, well, you've, uh, you know, you're an addiction counselor, uh, but you've also had your own struggles with this. So, if, you know, from your perspective as someone who's actually have the, has the personal experience, what is it, what, you know, what, what is it about, you know, the term food addiction that you find yourself relating to? And why do you, you know, why is it easy for you to see that, exist as a concept because I know it's controversial and we get into those discussions mm -hmm. in a minute, but, but, but just share your thoughts on this. So when, for the first time, when somebody said that there is something awesome. called food addiction, uh, you know, did your eyes light up and you say, Oh yeah, that's me. Oh. Yeah. What, well, what it's, that? it's interesting. I didn't actually get very good feedback when I uh, first explored the idea. Now I have to, of course, take you back to my twenties. I was in my twenties and that was a couple of decades ago. And so this idea of maybe being addicted to food um, wasn't widely accepted and still really isn't, but back then very much so. And so the best analogy that I can give is that I used food in the way that somebody living with alcoholism uses alcohol. So I wasn't really eating for nourishment. I wasn't eating because I was hungry. I was eating, I was really using food, using food to achieve a feeling. So maybe that feeling would be um, distraction, comfort. I was trying to obliviate pain. I was trying not to think about maybe some childhood trauma, the difficulties I was experiencing in my life. Um, and that's an important distinction to make between the biological need to eat that keeps us alive and the hormones that accompany that. And then there's this other thing going on in my brain, which is the desire to eat. And that is really driven by the reward center. And, make, and what, when it's driven by the reward center, it makes stopping very, very difficult. And when I try to stop in this particular sugar, which most people, it is sugar um, or different forms of sugar, I would experience withdrawal right? Whether those would be physical withdrawal symptoms like headaches and irritability or psychological withdrawal symptoms that often would drive me to want to eat it more. And I think for me, the hallmark of addiction is that you are experiencing consequences. So I had consequences from my eating and from my weight that I desperately did not want. And yet I could not seem to stop using food in the manner that I was using it. So, so over to you, um, uh, Peter. So from a medical definition, or if you look at the, you know, the catalog of how we define, you know, mental disorders, uh, there is a clear medical addiction, uh, you know, definition of addiction. So where do you think, uh, you know, when we talk about food addiction, how does that actually fit the medical uh, definition of an addiction, you know, where you have things like withdrawal and dependence and, you know, and you have to keep increasing the dose, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, you know, as someone who's worked in psychiatry and as an expert, what would you say, uh, you know, is there a perfect definition of addiction? And if yes, does that one, does that fully apply to, a, to, to eating or is it somehow a little bit different? So I, I, I would say, you know, with any mental disorder, including addictions, we don't have a good biological measure of it. Like, you know, I cannot stick somebody into a scanner and say, okay, you know, you had a PET scan of your brain or you had an MRI of your brain and Voila, you meet, you meet the criteria for, you know, you have an addiction. That's, we've been able to find it. Or, you know, it's, it's mostly questionnaire based. Even if, if I did a drug test on somebody and I found a drug in that person, on that person, it doesn't mean they're addicted. It means that the, the drug is present. So, so that's, you know, so I think the evolution of the definition of addiction uh, has really been looking at some issues that the determinants of it are like any chronic disease, biological, including genetics, uh, environmental, and, uh, and psychological, in terms of those three things coming together. And of course, the developmental factors of what happened to you growing up, uh, good, bad, and different. All of those will determine whether you're going to develop an addiction in, a, in an environment where there's high availability of something, whether it's you know, cigarettes, whether it's food, whether it's 
uh, cocaine or crack or alcohol, those, those things come together. They all have a common factor that they do affect the reward center, but over time, uh, they're not really being rewarding. They're just, it's not that I want to, it's I have to, right? It goes from wanting to, to, to having to or needing to, as a, otherwise you feel that. And of course, the use despite the consequences, which is no matter what harms are coming from it, the compulsion to use overrides any, any sort of cognitive or you know, thinking that comes to you and say, stop, don't do it. It gets overridden. So there's this loss of control and use despite harm. Having said so, that, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, having said that, the official, uh, you know, DSM and and ha don't have enough evidence and research studies that can easily quantify food as a category as an addiction. So uh, officially, but, but, it hasn't made it over the top. But I, I mean, for those of us who work in the field, if you actually look at it and the behaviors, it does, you know, it does have a lot of commonality. But again, it also has a lot of commonality with other compulsive behaviors, other eating disorders. So you, you have to be really careful uh, that we are not just creating another category. So, so speaking of that, because you've talked, you know, food is a complex. I mean, there's, you know, food is food. Uh, so when you think about that, you know, is it really possible to pinpoint a certain aspect of the food that's addictive or is maybe sometimes uh, this more does it fall into a category of what you would say a behavioral addiction? So when you look at gambling addiction or yeah. sex addiction or, you know, yeah. compulsive shopping, I mean, you've got, those are behavioral addictions, but there's not a substance, but it's a behavior that you become addicted to. So, I, I mean, that's a great question because, you know, we realize that these are brain circuits that, that can get triggered by external factors. Now, where there's an internal, obviously they're working internally, somehow they're activating them. When it comes to food, there are both aspects, right? We know that glucose in the brain releases the reward, in the reward center does release uh, uh, dopamine, which is the, the, you know, the, the neurochemical or brain chemical that's associated with reward. And that gets co-opted by all substances of abuse. So, so it, with food, I think we have to find out which food gives which person the high, and, because that's one circuit. But there are other circuits that I think Sandra spoke to so eloquently, right? That there is this issue around, uh, uh, you know, reduced reduction of stress, or feelings of comfort, the stress response system, all these other circuits are also getting involved. So as the understanding of addiction evolves, I think that can help inform better understand, I think as Vera, who's an expert in this, uh, in addiction medicine as well, and has to, is that, yeah, they, these are, can be seen as processes as well. But um, when it comes to food, there are probably both food and a biological basis for it as well. Uh, so Sandra, back to you. I mean, uh, you know, as you said, there was a point where you recognized that this was something that was starting to control you and it wasn't really helping, but you had to do it anyway. Uh, so when you started realizing that this is, you know, basically that you, you know, this, these are addictive type behavioral patterns that you have. Uh, what, what were the key, you know, what were the key moments that got you a to realize that, and secondly, what were the key steps that you then took to get things under control? Uh, you know, did you have counseling? Did you meet somebody? Did you try it on your own? Did you go to Overeaters Anonymous? I mean, how did you how did you deal with this uh, on your own? Can you can you just take us through that? You know, briefly through that that journey. Yeah. I think one of the first steps, you know, even though at the time I was 100 pounds heavier than I am today, I really had to let go of the dieting model um, because the dieting model offered me false hope. It said that I could lose 20 pounds in a month and I figured if I could just find the right diet and find some way to stick to it, then all my problems would be solved and that only left me heavier and heavier after each failed diet. So it was letting go of the diet mentality, letting go of the hope of even ever losing weight and deciding that I needed to focus on a way that I could eat that was peaceful because I couldn't keep living that way and I couldn't keep eating that way. And I remember going to my psychologist at the time and saying, oh, I think 
I could be addicted to food. And again, this was a long time ago, he kind of chuckled and said, oh, did you read that in Cosmopolitan? And I was so embarrassed. Um, and I went away from that appointment not knowing what to do. So I was quite lucky that I found a support group. And yes, it was in the 12-step community. Um, and I felt understood. And the way, what worked for me about that 12-step community was I identified foods that acted like drugs, right? And so even the term food addiction is not really an accurate description because most people are not addicted to whole foods. Whole foods requires a lot of chewing and fiber and our body reacts to them in natural ways. When in fact, most of us who identify as food addicts are addicted to chemically engineered industrial made foods. Um, and so for me, it was much easier to draw a line and say, I do not eat those foods. Um, then the cravings could begin to subside. Then I could experience for the first time in my life, appetite correction. I could actually get full on a meal. For some reason, my brain is more susceptible to those chemically engineered foods than maybe somebody else. And we do know um, that people who have lived with obesity, we know this through functional MRIs, our brains are more sensitive to food cues. Um, so what does that mean? When I walk into a room and there's a plate of cookies, my reward center lights up in a more dramatic way than say someone who's always been weight stable their whole lives. Um, and that also means that me having lived with obesity has to use many more tools not to give into wanting those. Um, and that other person who's been weight stable their whole life has no idea all the things that I'm doing internally not to give in, which may come to them very effortlessly. Uh, so, so, so thanks, uh, Sandra, for taking us through this. I want to give this back to, uh, uh, to Peter. So when we talk about approaches to addiction in general, uh, you know, we've got the you know, for me as a non-addiction person, I, I, I put them in two categories. We've got the category of abstinence, which you can do with alcohol and you can do with nicotine and, you know, other, other substances. Uh, and then you've got the approach of harm reduction where you can't really give up the substance and you kind of have to deal with it in, on an ongoing basis. So from your perspective, uh, I mean, first of all, let me ask you, I mean, do you make that, do you actually make that distinction? Uh, and if yes, then, then how do you approach this in the context of food? Yeah, so actually I, I, I make that distinction, but I actually have a little bit more uh, a different way of, of looking at it, slightly different way of looking at it. So what is the outcome you know, trying to get at? And there's some elements of the product. So in this case, you know, things that release dopamine in the brain in, in a way that is not meant to be released. So for example, you know, drinking a glass of juice can get you a big sugar rush. That's because it, you're, you're releasing you know, essentially extracted sugar that gives your brain that high of, of, uh, of dope from dopamine as opposed to having an orange, right? Which is much more released and slow release. So, so the question is, it's not just the product, it's not just sugar, but it's how the sugar is, is and that's where that common term is processed. You know, cocaine, if you have it as coca leaves in, the, in, the, in, the, in, in climbing Machu Picchu with you know, a few leaves here and there or in a tea, is, is not addictive, but you extract it into a white powder and snort it, it becomes more addictive. And then if you alkalinize it and make it into crack, then it becomes really addictive. But it's that interacting with somebody's genetic predisposition, a uh, way their brains do it, what's happened to them before. So if they've been traumatized in their life, their brains shift of how they experience reward. So that's why adverse childhood experiences, it, it, it will lead to high rates of obesity, higher rates of smoking, higher rates of lung disease, mostly mediated by the change that has happened to their brain and how they interact with substances. And, and then lastly, it's the environment in which that person is. So those three things act together. And so when you're trying to reduce that harm, uh, whether, you know, abstaining is important, but it may be for that person abstaining from refined sugars may be the way to go. For somebody, it may be re re abstaining from salty, you know, fat-filled uh, foods or, you know, more savory foods. Depending on what's in it for them and how, what meaning that has, you may have to shift it. Similarly, you have to may have alter the environment, right? If somebody has an environment where they're socially isolated and all they have is easy access to low, you know, high caloric, low cost foods with no opportunities to exercise and move. Now you're going to get 
higher consumption and more comfort from that reliable res resource, right? And then you have marketing of those products that make it easier to, to get. So, you know, for example, I went to Nunavut, the cost of a beer there is not that much different than it is in Toronto. But if you want to buy a bag of apples there, it's like $60, right? And the same bag of apples here is six bucks. So those political issues and marketing issues also all act together in creating an addiction. So, so Sandra, you wanted to make a comment? I think those points really lend itself to why we've seen a rise in, um, you know, addiction during COVID and why we've seen a rise in maybe emotional eating and addictive eating. I know that's very true in, in the clients that I help. It's because a lot of our tools have been taken away. Our, you know, we're, we, for a lot of us, we isolated pretty strictly for the beginning three months. Our exercise was taken away. Our community was taken away. And, uh, you know, often community is so important important in supporting somebody to live a life of recovery. So I feel like this time of COVID had so many drivers. It's almost a perfect recipe to ignite or, or increase uh, addiction. So Sandra, let me ask you now, you, you also work now as, a, as an addiction counselor and I, and, I, and I know you have a pretty successful operation going there. Uh, and I can imagine that a lot of people come to you even with the question of whether or not they might have a food addiction. And one of the things we do know is that it's not all of obesity. I mean, this is a no. small, small subset of people who have struggled with obesity. So, so what do you? Ha so, first of all, you know, when people come to you with this question, how do you make the distinction between people where you say, "Yes, I think this is a food addiction, and I think I can help you," versus the people, "No, I think uh, your problem is really not food addiction; it may be something else." So, so two questions. Uh, how do you make that distinction, and what are the other examples of people eating too much? that are absolutely have nothing to do with food addiction at all? Yeah, that's a great question. So one, there's many criteria to identify food addiction. There's the Yale food addiction scale. There's also what I prefer, which is a little quicker to get through, is the DSM seven criteria for substance abuse, uh, which I covered a bit of them. You know, there's the withdrawal, there's, you know, persistent attempts at counting down, which could be looked at as yo-yo dieting. There could be, uh, you know, the consequences um, and several, several other criteria. And people um, can easily say yes or no to them. Um, often I find people, there's not, I never convince somebody they're a food addict ever. They kind of know in their heart of hearts that um, they're using food like a drug and they're using it like a drug so much that it is crowding out the rest of their life. It's affecting their work. It's affecting their relationships how they relate to themselves. It's um, taking up a lot of mental real estate. It's sort of the first thing they think about in the morning. It's um, that constant tape of when am I gonna eat? Where am I gonna eat? Did I eat too much? Did I have a little less? It's all consuming. So I, like I said, never convince. People tend to know. And so what, what is food addiction not? I also run a program in Toronto with Dr. Sandy Van, which is emotional eating. So that looks more like like um, it's an episode, they have certain triggers that cause them to eat way too much. But the next morning they wake up and they're like, oh, I'm not going to do that. Maybe they don't do that for like another week or 14 days um, until the next one. Uh, but it certainly isn't affecting every single area of their life. They can easily identify what the triggers are, what the automatic thoughts are prior to eating. And they still have the cognitive ability. Um, and maybe that's not the right phrase, but they're more cognitively aware of the whole process and they can troubleshoot and start to change things so that they're not emotionally eating as much. Okay, so before we open up, uh, you know, for questions, I, I want to take it back to you, Peter. Um, you know, obviously dealing with addictions is, you know, is difficult and we know this. Uh, where does somebody turn to for professional help? Now, we've just heard from Sandra that she offers services. She's, a, she's an experienced uh, addiction counselor. Uh, but if you have to go to your family doctor or you're out living in the community, uh, where can you hope to find somebody who can support you here? So that's a great question. It depends on where you live. So in many places, I'll tell you what is universally available are 12 step programs, which are basically mutually uh, supports and that's most 
uh, amplified for the use of alcohol. And, and, and clearly there have been attempts with other substances to create things like Overeaters Anonymous and those kinds of things. But uh, again, the, you know, the evidence actually is coming out for AA is actually now coming out fairly strong that involvement in that fellowship is important. Otherwise, if depending on which health system you are, there usually is a substance use uh, treatment system. It's usually highly under, it's very underfunded and it requires, and there are addiction medicine physicians. Now, they, I, I can tell you, other than Vera, who's on the call today, there aren't that many, or if any, I, I don't think I can count or point to any other physician who does food addiction uh, training. Most, most addiction medicine docs in Canada, at least, are focused on managing the opioid epidemic and alcohol secondarily. Uh, the others get you know, done by the by. In fact, most addiction medicine docs, you'd be surprised, don't even treat tobacco addiction, even though it's the number one addiction that kills, you know, more, causes more harm than all the other addictions combined. So we have a problem of resources and treatment. But I would start with the family doctor, find out, but usually it's, biopsycho, it's a psychosocial intervention, and there may be an addiction service that, that, can, that, can, that can offer you, you care. And then places like where Vera works or, or people like Sandra who are hopefully increasing in numbers could help people who are struggling with this kind of, uh, whether it's food addiction classically or this binge uh, binge kind of consumption pattern, binge eating, where, where it's emotional eating and, and they are very, very amenable to cognitive behavioral therapy. So a cognitive behavioral therapist can help us and sort of uh, break that apart, maybe a place to go if you don't have uh, you know, fully trained uh, food addiction counselor. Okay, so, uh, so so thanks both of you for your statements. We're going to take some questions from the audience here. Uh, I'll give it back to Rachel. I think we've got preferential. Uh, if you really want to ask the question, turn your camera on because I can see there's a lot of questions already in the chat. Uh, we probably won't get to all of them. Uh, and we will take people who, have, who are live on camera first. So Rachel, over to you. Uh, yeah, thanks for mentioning that priority, Dr. Sharma. So I just want to very quickly remind everyone that, yes, you can ask your question in the chat box, and we will try to get to all the questions there. But the priority will be given to anyone that wants to come on their camera, and you can let us know that you want to be on camera and have a question by raising your hand electronically. If you go to the participant box and hit the little icon with the hand. Um, and also, we will be scanning. If you can't find that, if you just raise your hand physically, uh, we'll be scanning through all of the boxes to find anyone. Um, and I can see that we already have someone that's electronically raised their hand, Teresa. So I'm going to unmute you. You can let us know where you're calling in from and then ask your question. So I'm trying to unmute you, Teresa, but oh, there we go. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, my question for you is, okay, I've been a yo-yo dieter for a long time. Um, when I started my first official so-called diet, I was 14. And my biggest concern ever since then um, has been brain fog. So I, I believe there's a, definitely a connection. But I noticed that when I was in high school, I noticed that for some reason I couldn't retain information. And as I'm getting older, I don't know if it's the food I'm eating. I don't know if it's um, if the contents of fat because I reduced it so many times. I've been on every diet. Dr. Wharton's Clinic, Diet Center, uh, Weight Watchers, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Brown in Toronto. Um, anyways, there's just been so much. And I, again, my, my, what I'm trying to really work hard on is the actual retention of information. And I feel like it's just that there's this brain fog where I'm talking about something and it's like, okay, what, what was I thinking now? And okay. it just goes. Uh, well, thank you, Teresa, for that question. I think I'll, I'll, I'll first hand this over to Peter, and I want to just add, and so when I hear the term brain fog, then people have fo problems focusing, problems remembering things, uh, problems, you know, just getting organized. I mean, the first thing that comes to mind for me, uh, again, as a non-psychiatrist, is actually attention deficit disorder, uh, and I think that there is a pretty straightforward link between ADD, ADHD, and addiction forms, and all of it might relate to genetics and trauma or whatever it is. Uh, can, can you, Peter, try to take that apart for us and yeah. explain what these conditions actually are and how they might be related? So the first thing I go is actually I say, you know what, this just may be normal. First, okay. we have to assume that this is normal. It is part of us getting older, us having too many things coming at us, and it may or may not have a pathological basis to it. Then you have to say, okay, is there anything, you know, more 
sinister going on with respect to is this, you know, as, as people age, is this more of some sort of early onset dementia, those kinds of things. And clearly those require, you know, it's very specific tests. So it's usually not a brain fog, you know, it's a very specific, you know, getting lost, not knowing where you are, those kinds of things. It's not the usual thing. I, you know, I'm seeing this person and I just can't remember their name. I can't recall, you know, those kinds of things. So it's very distinct from that. And then, of course, there are things that go, you know, that, that are sort of the cognitive deficits. And then, of course, there are things like mood. So whether it's, you know, anxiety, mostly depression or bipolar disorder, those are the ones that are big that cause sort of memory issues and can, 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 can be quite disabling, right? Memory, having memory problems, especially in untreated depression. You can see that quite often. Uh, and then, of course, there are things like... Um, Attention deficit disorder, which to me is a, it is a diagnosis of exclusion and should have been a pattern of behavior going on since childhood, you know, where, and it's very interesting, women and men have, there are gender differences of how this manifests. So women more likely are to have the attention deficit, which is more inattention as opposed to hyperactivity. So you may see some of that. And so I, I, I mean, I think it's, Hard to, to sort of diagnose that unless you have somebody who knows the person actually do a series of tests and then say, yes, I think this is reassuring. This is normal. You may need to compensate for, you know, when you're doing tasks, focus on one task at a time. Uh, those kinds of things reduce the amount of multitasking we do. Um, or it may be simply, uh, you know, one of these things that I talked about that require a diagnosis. So, uh, you know, and again, I, the be, one of the best ways is to ask if other people have noticed that you're becoming, your yeah, memory is not good, you know? That's Sandra, good, any comments from your side? Yeah, I think um, if we wanted to look at a more superficial level, also examining how you feel after eating certain foods or certain meals, does it get exacerbated with, uh, you know, more of those chemically engineered industrial foods, or is it a constant state? Okay, okay Rachel. All right. Um, we have uh, Dr. Vera Tarman that would actually like to uh, speak with us. So I'm going to unmute you. And uh, I know that there's been some questions that you've been answering in the chat box also around online communities. So really great to hear from you. Uh, thank you. And thank you so much. I'm so pleased that this talk is online like this and that so many people you can't believe how happy I am. But uh, just to keep things real quick, um, the, uh, there, there are now virtual uh, OA communities as well as other 12-step communities. There's like four or five of them. So there is a lot of online support and it's free and it's available. It's very good. Um, that's the first thing. Second thing, Facebook is getting more and more online support as well. I, I have a, uh, I'm sweet enough, sugar-free for life, a Facebook page. There's at least two or three others that people can join in, um, and that's free as well. Uh, there are a few people like Sandra who are doing stuff um, in Ontario and in Canada, and uh, if you want uh, more information for patients, contact Sandra and also contact me. I'm happy to give you my resources. Um, Renaissance does have something, but because of COVID, they're on hold. And Finally, I want to say that there is a small group of low-carb doctors, they're sort of keto-based, um, and they are actually becoming very interested in food addiction and are also doing counseling. So that's another potential resource of physicians who are open-minded to this subject. And because it's keto or low-carb, they're already doing sugar-free and flour-free. So they've kind of stumbled on the, the, the solution already. Um, so I don't want to take up more time. Those are some really great resources. Okay. Well, thank you, Vera, thank you. for those comments, and and for the, those of you who don't know Vera Turman, she's one. Of, she's a physician in Toronto who is uh, pretty much the only one specialized in, in food addiction, I guess, uh, probably in the country even. Uh, so back to you, Rachel. Okay, great. Um, we have Carrie, who I'm going to unmute right now. So Carrie, let us know where you're calling in from and your question. Hi, I'm calling in from Niagara Falls, and I myself am a bariatric patient, 12 years out, um, started at 300 pounds. Uh, I have gained a little during the lockdown. Uh, my question is that relates to uh, medically supervised weight loss programs and uh, also pre-op programs for people going through bariatric surgery and how they rely very, very heavily on uh, processed protein shakes. And these protein shakes are basically mimics of junk foods, right? So uh, milkshakes, and then you have like protein bars, which are mimics of chocolate bars. 
uh, even the vitamins are now gummies <laughs> and mimics of candy. And um, I feel that this sort of perpetuates the tendency to go to those types of foods. And so if people do have a food addiction problem dealing with those types of foods, it almost encourages the perpetuation of that type of behavior. And I'm wondering if you've done any consults with uh, those medical communities to sort of change the protocol. Okay, so, so Kerry, thanks, thanks so much for that question because I think it's a super important question. Uh, and maybe I can, I can answer part of it and then I will, I'll hand it off. Uh, so, the, uh, so you've talked about the fact that there's a lot of surgical programs that sometimes use uh, you know, shakes or bars or some, kind of, some form of meal replacement uh, prior to surgery. <coughs> now, the real reason for doing that is generally not because it's a treatment for obesity, but because uh, what the surgeons would like to see happen is actually that people lose weight before surgery. So that, then that makes their job a lot easier. And if you make the surgeon's job a lot easier, it means they can see what they're doing and that reduces the risk of actually having the surgery. So the things that you're talking about are not part of a long-term treatment plan. They're actually just a, a way to get people to lose a significant amount of weight prior to surgery. Uh, and that is a challenge. You know, when you put people on a, on a shake and say, you know, this is all you're going to eat for the next three months or three weeks or whatever the time frame is, uh, you want to make sure that people actually use it. Uh, and that's why they are sometimes, you know, you, you want to make it as palatable as possible so people actually take it. And the same goes for the gummies, that if you make them very unpleasant, then people are just not going to take them. So that's partly part of the story, but, I, but I'm correct. Uh, uh, but you're right that uh, it can be very challenging to be taking any of these products if you are, especially if you're someone who's dealing with food addiction. And maybe Sandra can speak to that. Uh, you know, yeah. when you look at all of the formula diets that are out there, all of the bars that you can buy, all of the shakes that are available. I mean, often these things are loaded with sugar or sweeteners. Yeah, I, I think, you, you know, this is such a good question. And I think uh, Peter also spoke to it that, you know, some people might be addicted to sugar and some people might be addicted to salty, fatty food. And so I kind of boil it down to trigger foods. So trigger food is very unique to you. And these are foods uh, that we would obsess about, foods that once we start, we can't really have a reasonable portion. Or if we have a trigger food, might lead us down the road of compulsively overeating, even different foods. And so what what's really important about what Carrie brought up is that having a chocolate bar that's disguised as a protein bar can absolutely be triggering and lead us down that path of wanting to eat more and more foods. And the same with, you know, a protein shake that's supposed to mimic a, a milkshake. Um, so yeah, it is very interesting. I think you bring up such a great point. I would love to see change in this area because, you know, we, you know, I understand uh, Arya's point that this is for a short time with a very specific reason, uh, but it could have some lasting effects after surgery is done. So, so, so Peter, I mean, would this be, you know, would, you know, is this methadone for food or is it more complex than that? I think it's more complex than that, but actually I, I have a feeling if it was methadone for food, you would have it and then you wouldn't feel hungry for a long yeah. period of time. You wouldn't eat for 24 hours, right? The problem is it's, it's, it's more, you know, so I can understand why you're trying to do that in the short term. And I, yes, you know, if I have somebody who's, and I was gone into the hospital and they have a very a rip roaring, uh, you know, addiction to an opioid on the street, like fentanyl. You're, you're not going to cure their addiction while they're in hospital. You need to just maintain their levels of opiates so that they can get their treatment for their heart valve infection, for example. Right. And if you don't do that, they don't stay, they go in fact and get another infection. So, so it depends on the, where you're using these things. Uh, they have a role. The issue is when you're going into what I would say the maintenance side of things, then you need a product from a maintenance perspective that actually shows benefit. Because in this situation, those kinds of foods that are driven not so much by the calorie or what have you, but it's the what it stands for, what it means, and what it does to the person. So that I think to use this common language term would be it's a trigger rather than that. So rather than actually reducing consumption, it actually triggers and and sort of primes for more. So I would think that, when, and you know, it's very interesting to me is, and, and we're looking at some of the newer medications that, uh, that are out there, like the GLP-1 receptor agonist, that is telling me that there's something else going on that has to do with satiety and pleasure 
combining. And that's where I think that intersection in substances that we consume. And if you know, all substances of abuse are plant products, right? They, are, they actually come, it's just, whether it's alcohol, it's a fermented plant product, you know, nicotine comes from a plant, cocaine comes from a plant, you know, stimulants come from a plant, and then of course it gets synthetic. But again, that is something to keep in mind. And so it's that in, in our brains, I think it's that interaction between things that have to do with getting full of satiety and pleasure intersecting. Uh, so Peter, just because you brought up the topic of medication, uh, you know, let's be very quick about this, that in obesity medication, we, we don't have a lot of choice in Canada. We've got three medications out there. Right. Uh, you've mentioned the GLP ones, but we also have a medication that's actually a com combination of bupropion uh, and naltrexone. Now naltrexone, yeah. everybody knows is, is a drug that's actually used in the treatment of addiction. So uh, can you just, you know, tell us about, a little bit about that combination the, the bupropion naltrexone combination uh, what is it supposed to do? Who is it for? And yeah. you know, are there, you know, is there a role for it in obesity management? Is there a role for it in addiction management? Yeah, absolutely. So bupropion is used for the treatment of people addicted to tobacco, right? To smoking, and it seems seems to compete at the at a receptor level for for the pleasure from smoking. But it also has a stimulant effect, and so it may be just having that effect on appetite. Naltrexone is your quintessential anti-addiction drug because it blocks all your endorphins. In the receptors where pleasure is mediated through endorphins, it blocks that. And we see that we use naltrexone to treat, actually, you would think opiates, but actually it's better in treating people with alcohol problems. It blocks the pleasure from alcohol. And people taking that will say, I had a couple of my favorite drink and I couldn't, I couldn't finish it. I put it down. So that combination is a very intriguing combination in the use of for obesity, because again, it sounds like it, it, it is potentially reducing the pleasure from food as well as reducing the appetite as well. So that to me is where it's probably working together. But you can see how it's, you know, it's, it's, it's pulling from addiction literature to treat this kind of consumptive behavior. The side effect of it is weight loss. If, if you want to think about it, because what we are doing is getting to the core core issue. And, you know, even bariatric surgery, in many cases, my sort of, you know, lay understanding of it is I, I, I'm wondering whether we are operating on the wrong part of the body, because the problem actually may not be there. It may be actually, after that surgery, what it actually does to the brain connections and what chemicals from the gut go to the brain, as opposed to you know, reducing the size of the stomach, which is a very concrete thing. Uh, because we do know people who have bariatric surgery can end up compensating by developing a very wicked alcohol problem after. So, you know, so it's very intriguing. I think we don't know all the answers, but, you know, I think there's some really, really interesting things of this intersection between addiction and, and, and obesity. And, and not to say that they're the same thing, but in many ways that addictive eating Obesity could be a side effect of it. Okay, so Rachel, back to you. Okay, we have, uh, we have another electronic hand raised and that's from Stephen. So Stephen, I'm going to unmute you and you can, well, we all know that you're calling from Malaysia, but uh, you can introduce yourself and ask your question. Hello you everyone, uh, I'm Stephen from Malaysia, a GP and also a uh, lecturer from University Science Malaysia. So uh, myself is a person with obesity who have lost around uh, 40 pounds over the over eight years. So currently I'm in remission and uh, on maintenance dietary modification. And uh, as you all know that I'm passionate in helping people living with obesity. But uh, from the perspective of food addiction, if we think uh, obesity because of food addiction, sometimes I wonder, should we share our experience as a health care providers with our patient, will it affect uh, the relationship, uh, the doctor-patient or the advocate or the provider-patient relationship? Okay. This is the first question. And on the second question, in another spectrum, a healthcare providers who have struggled to lose weight uh, to achieve their obesity management goal, should they actually be involved in obesity management? Because I tried to advocate to my colleagues in uh, managing obesity, but fail because they say, I'm going to manage my weight first uh, before okay. I go and manage the people. So uh, this question uh, towards Sandra, what's your opinion? Yeah. Thank you. 
Sure. So, so, so thank you, Steve, for that question, which brings up, which opens up a whole can of worms, by the way, because this is the famous question of how does the provider's behavior or the healthcare, so how does the doctor's behavior or the doctor's appearance, uh, or for that matter, any appearance, uh, actually affect the therapeutic relationship? So what I often hear is, you know, when, when I have a patient who goes to see a provider who you know, herself or himself does not look like they ever had an obesity problem. They say, well, I mean, this person doesn't even understand what I'm talking about. They've never experienced it. And uh, uh, so, so, so the question is really, I mean, you know, does having personal experience with a disease make you a better provider? And is that even cause? So now my, my, my answer to that is you don't have to have survived cancer to be a good oncologist. And you don't have to be a woman to be a good gynecologist. Uh, because you can be professionally actually do those things. Uh, so there's an intersection that there, there might even be a bias involved that if I have used a certain technique and it has helped me, maybe now this is what I'm giving to all my patients because it helped me. And so actually there's a provider bias there. So, so it might be better that you ha don't have your personal experience, but you actually know the literature. So uh, that's my quick answer, but I want to give this to Sandra. Sandra, what's your experience when you go in, you know, to see a doctor, um, uh, and, and, and you're seeing, well, this is not really, you know, I don't think this person can help me because they don't personally have my problem. Yeah. So a great question. I heard two questions, right? One is, should I share my own personal experience? And then, you know, what shape is the doctor in and should they? So um, for me, again, I started searching over 27 years ago for a solution. And the solution that I always got repeatedly was move less and eat more. And quite frankly, that made me feel incredibly discouraged. And it made me feel inadequate because it seemed so simple. And it was something that I couldn't do. And I really couldn't get the help until until I, I worked with other people who used food the way I used it and they kind of showed me the way out. Now, 27 years later, I think things have definitely changed. I'm quite fortunate, so I do share my personal uh, story, but I am not a doctor. And so doctors need to follow certain rules and regulations that I do not need to. I find that sharing my story helps people understand that I've walked in their shoes and I understand the nuances and the struggles in a very intimate way. Because living with obesity um, is a very vulnerable thing. So when you're, you know, obesity is not just about stats and numbers, it's about a human vulnerability and that it affects us physically, emotionally, mentally. Not only, you know, with obesity as a disease, it's the only disease where there's a whole billion dollar industry feeding false lies, where there is so much shame from the media, where there's so many expectations, very little pity, very little compassion. I don't think there's another disease out there like that right now. Um, so the, so can you, I mean, would it have been helpful if I saw a doctor who shared part of their story? Yes. And I just don't know if you can, right? Because you, you have regulations. And then the other piece is, well, what about what the doctor looks like? And so, you know, even though I've you know, lost 100 pounds, am I going to be slender? No. But my success is real success. This is what success really looks like. It looks like somebody who maybe isn't slender, who from time to time will ebb and flow with their weight, um, who will struggle on a daily basis. That's what it really looks like. And we need to show our patients the reality because the before and after Instagram world feeds the stigma and feeds the bias. So we need proper representation. Okay, so, so, so Peter, uh... Do you, do you trust a cardiologist who smokes nicotine? <laughs> look, I, you know, I, I look at people as people, right? And, and providers are people too. So they, you know, they can have their own, their, their own worries. The issue is, can they empathize? Can they understand what it's like for that person? And so what I talk about it is, are you able to bring your expert knowledge in a way that the person who you're helping or attempting to help uh, is is sees it for what it's worth, and you can see what their expertise they bring to the table, and so keep that open mind that they have, you know, perspectives on on what they have to do outside of your ten minute, twenty minute, thirty minute, once a week appointment. You know, they have to that, those other things outside of the appointment are going to determine the outcome much more than what happens in the appointment. So, so the expertise that's required for it to work is actually more lies with the person walking in than what has been through the years of training that we've had. 
So I think coming to that with humility is the key issue. So do I trust a cardiologist who smokes? Well, as long as he's not smoking while he's doing my procedure, that's fine. Uh, and, you know, but on the other hand, because if everybody's like, is, is that it? But, you know, so that's, I, so that, I, I mean, we need to be non-judgmental. And I, that's how I look at it. Just, just, okay. you know, right. go so with Peter, uh, Unfortunately, we're speak. running out of time, so we won't be able to take any further questions. Uh, just one last word to you. You've been involved with Obesity Canada off and on, you know, in various capacities, and you've had the opportunity there. Uh, where, where do you see a role for an organization like Obesity Canada to be playing in this field? Uh, you know, is it just events like this or is there more that Obesity Canada could be doing to support people living with food addiction? Well, I, I mean, I certainly think within your, you know, within your sort of strategic directions, clearly helping advance the field to help, you know, the, whether it's investment in fellows or investment in the science to, to help us. Because right now there's a lot of distrust of the concept of food addiction in the first place, primarily because people have the skimming knowledge, right? They'll say, well, you can't be absent from food, so therefore you can't have food addiction. Or it's, you know, they'll just, they'll just brush it off. That how can you live without food? You know, so therefore it, there can't be food addiction. So you do need the science to come behind it. And I think Obesity Canada can play a huge role in, in making sure that there's a, a huge investment in that kind of research. Uh, and, and that kind of work. So that's one. And then, of course, making sure that there's some sort of understanding of what is food addiction and what isn't, because there is overlap. And you, what you don't want is people with a binge eating disorder or anorexia being treated as food addicts, when, when in fact there's a whole different uh, goal there. So I think those are the kinds of things to help differentiate and better define what it is. And then maybe have some standards in, in, of how one should proceed in the absence of full knowledge to help people. Well, well, thank you, Peter. Uh, Sandra, any last words on, on, you know, you've been very involved with Obesity Canada. Uh, you, you know, where do you see the role that Obesity Canada could be doing? Uh, what it could, be, could it be doing even more to be supporting both people living with the problem, but also making sure that health professionals really understand what the problem is in the first place? Yeah, I, I, you know what, that was one of the best decisions I made professionally was to join the board in Toronto. It allowed me to uh, sit at the table with some leading experts in obesity who are open to and understanding uh, what are the treatment options for this, uh, for this group of people. And because Obesity Canada is that trusted resource that you make sure that you're only offering things that are evidence-based, um, being a resource for food addiction would be incredibly helpful. Okay. Well, I'd like to thank both of you for taking the time out. Uh, I want to thank everybody who's joined us. And I'm going to, uh, uh, you know, just on behalf of uh, Obesity Canada, thank everybody for attending the chat. Uh, this is going to be the last event in this series, but we are not done. Uh, there's going to be other series, so stay tuned. Uh, we do have your, your contacts on mailing lists, and you will be getting invitations uh, as soon as, uh, you know, this event or a similar event starts up again. Uh, so back to you, Rachel, for the last few words. And thank you again, everybody, for joining. Uh, great. Thank you, Dr. Sharma. So a couple of things just before we end our conversation here today. Um, I would like to announce that uh, something really exciting is happening next month, and that's the rollout of the cl clinical practical guidelines. And what that does is allow patients uh, to feel empowered to receive evidence-based treatment options. And this is a very important initiative. So Obesity Canada has been working for months to pull this together Together, and now we're excited that we're looking at how we're going to start to roll that out. Um, and I just want to remind everyone that Obesity Canada is a charity. So if you would like to support these kinds of initiatives, please donate. Uh, there should be a link in your chat box. And if you're watching a recorded version of this, you should find something in your show notes. And the final thing that I wanted to mention is, as Dr. Sharma has mentioned, you know, we want to keep this conversation going. We've built a wonderful global community here. Um, and and we would like to hear from you about what you would like to see next. So this is the last episode of the Hope Series, but we want to make sure that we continue this conversation. So please give us your feedback and uh, we'll um, play a role in shaping what those conversations look like in the future. So thank you. Thank you for being a part of this community. And I hope you have a lovely rest of your day wherever you may be in the world. Uh, bye for now. Thank you. Bye, everybody.